This show has really gone downhill today. Well, I'm glad it's mine. Should I try to save it? Go ahead. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? It's time for something that will lift up all of our spirits, starting with the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. Jim, how about some classic audio from before you were in the business, but just slightly before, but you were around, so maybe you'll have some insight. Here's a video, some audio here. What? From March 7th, 1981, The Dream Machine Quitting the First Family. Oh. Jimmy Hart, Wayne Ferris, Tojo Yamamoto. Jimmy, can we slow down the cheerleading a minute to let me ask you this? We've got the situation pretty well defined defined in here. Tommy Rich is unable to be here today, which leaves the options as follows. The fact that the Southern Tag Team Champions will forfeit the titles to your challenging team today. This is not going to happen. The second thing, Dundee has already said that he would wrestle against both of them in this special one-fall 30-minute championship match. But the third thing, and I ask you this, and I would give you some very good advice, that if you went in there today in a handicap match and won it, the fans are not going to respect you. They're not going to respect the team or the win, even if they did take the title away from Dundee. And uh, the reasonable thing, it seems to me, to do and good advice would be to postpone it till Tommy Rich can be back. Dundee and Rich can then to defend against him. Nobody's trying to get out of the match, but I think that a postponement would be the very wise thing for you to do in here. Can we get a postponement on the match today? Let me stop it there for a second. He's amazing. What incredible. He laid the whole thing out for everybody so they could understand it. Obviously, if you're somebody hearing a lot of these names for the first time, it may have gone past you. But for the viewers of the program 40 years ago, they knew exactly what's going on. It's presented so level-headedly, so reasonably, uh, conversationally. Lance was... And, you know, and he sounded genuine. Yeah. That's why he was everybody's, you know, favorite uncle. Well, you know, the thing, too, is he was never hyperbolic. He was never like a Shivani out there, like, oh, this son of a bitch or whatever. And because of that, he's talking to the lead heel manager. He's just talking to him. Jimmy Hart's standing there staring at him. It's not like they have to go out there and fight right away. Right. Even when Lawler would make fun of Lance, you knew that you could stop and listen to him. He was a reasonable guy. And that connected with the audience. Lance didn't Lance didn't go with the heels first, like you know, how dare you come out here unless they had just done something heinous, but he would start an interview being the broadcaster, and then the heel could be the dick. Instead of Lance trying to steal the fucking he would explain things and bridge to things and transition things, and you could bounce things off of him. He wasn't trying to be the the baby face. Well, he just laid out the whole thing. The studio audience listened. Ferris and Yamamoto are out there with Jimmy Hart. Here's Jimmy Hart's response. Oh, you, you really would. You, you think that I we would should advise postpone you that it, right? If you want the oh. respect that these men, I'm sure, are looking for as champions, <laughs> that you would postpone it until you can win it rather than oh. just trying to beat one man. You know what? I, I think he wants us to postpone the match. Can you believe that? Russell, that's why you're an announcer and I'm a manager. Are you crazy? You know, if the fans didn't respect me, you know how much sleep I would lose over that? Do you know actually how much sleep I would lose over that, man? <laughs> something man why don't you overlook the buck for once and do the decent oh, yeah. thing about it and postpone it let me tell you why because jimmy hart has worked hard all of his life man i've been in memphis tennessee my whole life i've thrown papers i've worked at gov service stations i've had gold records and for 14 months i've been in professional wrestling and it's been the greatest thing to ever happen to jimmy hart and do you think actually that's what those rules are for you fool because of people like dundee and tommy rich man i got a toothache i'm sick my wife sick i can't be here you know the you're an idiot man he's not making any excuse he got <laughs> caught in the middle of a contract oh situation yeah right. and uh, he couldn't be here today it's well uh, that simple. yeah okay well i'll tell you what i'm gonna do bill dundee is a superstar if he's a superstar well then let him get up in the ring and earn his status he's supposed to be big macho man okay. so dundee come on up the title he's match will be today and we will be the new southern heavyweight champion that he will wrestle you to oh, beautiful. if that's going to make you feel like what a big man or these two guys you, going in there let me stop it for a second here it's interesting to hear him say it this is 14 months into his career as a wrestling manager 
Yes. And the first bit of that, he didn't do any promos, really. Because he was he was Lawler's manager, which Jerry at the time liked to have managed, whether it be Mickey Poole or, or some of the other guys he would have to second him, so, uh, Private Buddy Diamond at one point, just a, a a guy that he could use as a stooge at ringside to pass him the gimmicks and, you know, throw the, the boot in or whatever the fuck. And it was another toy that Lawler had to get heat. He did all the talking, but he still got so much heat on Jimmy. The fans were beating Jimmy up before Jimmy even said anything. And, and then obviously when Lawler got hurt, that's when Jimmy had to carry the ball. And all of a sudden, as Mama Cornette used to say, we found out he was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. And he started talking. You couldn't shut him up. And it was, you know, this was only a little over a year into him starting in the wrestling business from scratch. Let's go back to this audio right now. Out here, baby, yeah, if he wants to be out here. One man. Well, get him out. Who okay. cares, man? Well, You're looking at the next you champion, bring him baby, and that's one of it. Your out here. Hey, baby. Come on. Dream, we got I've been back here watching what's been going on. And I've had it up to here. I've been watching what's going on. You've been giving me the run around for now three months. You brought me in here three months ago to fight Jerry Lawler. He beat me by the skin of his teeth. But he also, he whooped a lot of people. He also whooped Joe LaDuke. He whooped Austin Idol. He whooped Jimmy Vann. He whooped everybody. He whooped everybody. But you've been giving me the run around for a long time. And now today, I can't believe what you're doing today. You've got this title match right here. I should be in there. I've been loyal to you longer than Tojo Yamamoto, longer than Wayne Ferris, longer than Dutch Mantel. I've been loyal to you longer than anybody, Jimmy. I've been with you since dirt. And now this, now this comes about. I can't believe what's going on. I'm tired of sitting in the back seat. You're playing with my head. You're playing with my pocketbook. You're playing with my money, man. Hey, I don't like it. And I want to know today. I want to know today. You know that Bill Dundee can't whoop two men. Can't no guy whoop two men. But I want to know today, will you change that match and put the dream machine in there where I rightfully belong? You change the match today. That's all I want to know. Are you going to change it? No, listen to me. Hey, I got hey, something. Hey, oh, come hey, on, that's man. it. Okay. Come on. <laughs> Looks like uh, the Jimmy Hart organization has a little disorganization. No more. In. No more. No more. No more. You, I'm not under you. No more. That's it. Yay! Problem here and there, well, Jimmy. I'll tell you what. I don't... Let me stop hey, it there for I, a second. I was about to say, hold on to it there because the people are screaming, yay, just because he came and said, I quit, I'm done, and walked out. That's, again, that's maybe they should have taken a page out of that for Will Osprey when he had his little conversation with Don Callis instead of, oh, I really would like to go out on my own. Well, you mean so much to me, boy. What the fuck? No wonder nobody gives a shit. And he said the little thing there that connects with anyone. Dream Machine's a ridiculous character. The way he talks in the mask. You're messing with my head. You're messing with my money. You know, actually, but actually, that that was the way Troy talked. There, there was not any element of. How you did know, he say tired? Tired. He, tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of it. I'm way past tired of it. That's uh, there was no accent put on nor television verbiage there. But go ahead. If this was AEW, not to compare anything to AEW, but if this was modern wrestling, there would have already been a brawl. The breakup would have already happened. Like everything would have already happened. This speaks to not just the importance of letting things play out, but also the importance of having different tones of the commentators and of the entire show. The audience in this segment alone was loud at the beginning, got quiet to hear things, reacted to Jimmy Hart, and then reacted to Dream Machine. That's what you want. But if everything yeah. is just screaming at the audience all the time, it goes right past you. And or, uh, God damn it, you didn't hand me my mail in time. Let's fight. Boom. It just, uh, things have to, well, continue with this because it's not over with. Uh, there's a little bit more here. Let's go to this. I don't need the big Goodyear blimp in there. He's been eating me out of house and home, so who really cares? But let me just tell you right now, baby, you're looking at the next Southern Heavyweight Champion, so Superstar Dundee, come on, pack your lunch, baby, and come on out, baby. Well, it isn't over with yet. Remember this. I would bring to your attention the fact that Dundee clearly stated it. He does not have to win the match. All he has to do is avoid being beaten. 
And that's the end of this clip right there. But now, well, do we have the the, the end of the match? Uh, hold on. Let me go to the match. Because you got to hear what happens because we, we brought them this far and you got to hear these people screaming and squealing like pigs stuck under a gate. Well, Jim, let's now go to part two. This is the match. Bill Dundee handicap match for the tag titles against Tojo Yamamoto and Wayne Farris. The Honky Tonk Man. March 7th, 1981. We're going to join the match in progress. Lance Russell on the call. Bill Dundee getting his ass kicked. Head wide open. Dundee bleeding now. He's hurt. That's what he had to stay away from. Ferris pulls him up. Nails him. Right in the left eye. Dundee down. Tag on Yamamoto. Referee moving Ferris out of there. Both eyes now. Jimmy Hart really feeling happy. Well, up to this point, he had really given it a go. Used a very, very good tactic. But Ferris stopped him on the floor. Dundee bleeding on both eyes, and Yamamoto methodically chopping him up now. Coming up on the 15-minute mark, Tojo stings him. Dundee trying to kick at him, caught him with one foot, didn't catch him full. He's groggy. Bill trying to fight his way out of it. At the 15-minute mark, he's now halfway through. Dundee goes for Yamamoto, then Ferris, the referee, trying to get one up out of there. Dundee pounding Ferris. Ferris down in a corner. He grabs Yamamoto on a whip. Nice drop kick. Billy needs the head on the outside. Ferris catches him at the rope.
The belts are still going to go to it, okay? And, and I didn't want to interrupt any of that because that was like listening to the old boxing films or the boxing radio broadcasts of the 40s with Lance. You can hear the inflection, the emotion, the ups and downs. He calls it. He lays it out. He lays out when necessary. The details that aren't there, but you can't tell, even when you're watching tele. Dundee bleeding from both eyes now. No, he did a regular blade job. But nobody knew what that was then. But just that he said bleeding from both eyes now. Oh, my God, Lance is there. He can see it. He's in person. Little details like that and just the, the credibility in his voice and the concern that he has when people are doing something wrong. And then... You know, you could hear the people living and dying with every time that Dundee would fight back. And then, of course, the heels still have to fuck him. Tojo threw the salt in his eyes. And then you're you're hearing the people when Dundee's showing the referee, look, it's salt, it's salt. And then when Dream comes out, those people in that studio, they would literally scream so loudly in that television studio that they normally did news in or you'd do a cooking show in that it would distort the audio of the microphones. It would peak out all the fucking meters. They wouldn't be able to handle it. And that tra- that kind of excitement translated across the screen to the to the people watching that show. That's why Memphis TV was the highest rated television program in the country. And you can feel that, you know, they're they're screaming at shit. They're screaming. They're just jumping up and down and fucking screaming. You were taking photos at this period of time. Were the fans ready to turn the dream machine? What did you think? Yes. Um, I mean, they weren't, they weren't ready in terms of, oh my God, we want to cheer this guy, but he was over as a heel and he had been Lawler's original uh, opponent when Lawler had come back from the broken leg. And the reason was but that was before they started bringing in Lawler's historic rivals, the Austin Idol, and uh, there was the Hulk Hogan and Joe LaDuke and all those guys, because they knew that Lawler's return from a year off with a broken leg and the chance to get five minutes with Jimmy Hart was going to be what drew. And so they put the mask on Troy, who, as we've mentioned before, had been, you know, he was from Memphis, but he'd been working Mississippi and outlaws, and he'd been trying to get booked, and he could do the promo, where there he was playing it straight. And that's another thing, there was a Jerry Jarrett kind of touch, and you could hear in what in the way that Lance explained it so logically and a believable point of view, Jerry Jarrett would have laid that out for him in Jerry's words, and then Lance put it in his own words. And that was another Jerry Jarrett point. Don't go out and be Dusty Rhodes. Don't go out and be the dream machine. Go out and be Troy Graham. You're really upset. And that's why he didn't do the patter there, right? But they knew the dream could talk. And putting him under a mask as the dream machine, will somebody think it's Dusty Rhodes? Maybe, maybe not. But we'd And they sold out. That was the, the, the first appearance of Troy Graham in the Memphis Mid-South Coliseum. I take it back, second. He had worked there one time before, about a year and a half before. The second time he was ever there, he was in a main event and on a complete sellout. He was Troy T. Tyler the previous time? He was uh, Troy T. Tyler when he was working in Knoxville for some reason. they, they Maybe they were just taking a look at him at that point, but they they teamed him up with the assassins at a six man against Sonny King. And I can't remember who. And then you never saw him again until the dream machine. And nobody knew it was him. They didn't remember him anyway, but then because he was such a great promo, right? And then at that point, I think they, I can't remember who had just turned or who had left, but they were kind of short on baby faces. And so they did that turn and Dream was automatically, he and Dundee became a team, won the belts from Ferris and Tojo, worked with uh, Onita and Masafuchi when they were here, managed by Tojo. And uh, Dream was, uh, 
the number three babyface for a while behind Lawler and Dundee. Just and then and then they turned him again back heel <laughs> that fall and he teamed up with Eddie. He was back in the family. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Jimmy Hart's little kicks when he gets in there and starts kicking Dundee when he's down. No one yes. kicked like Jimmy Hart did. Like these fast kicks that were just coming at him. The, li the little peripatetic kicks. And it was because <laughs> Jimmy was his, you know, he was so skinny. If he got sunburned, he looked like a thermometer, as Lawler would say. And he didn't try to look like he was hurting anybody he, but he, he he looked like he was he was trying in his own way but he was completely ineffectual at doing it and i kind of stole some of that stuff from my repertoire also i'll hit somebody but i don't want them to sell it the date's interesting too because this is march 7th they're doing this angle that starts with tommy rich being knocked out of action less than two months later he wins the nwa title well as a matter of okay then right there, and I don't know why I didn't realize it at the start, that was when Tommy had left or was in the process of leaving and going back to Atlanta, and uh, they needed a new baby face because Dundee and, and, and Rich had been teamed up at that. But see, Tommy had come back in late 1980. That's a weird run right there as a heel. Well, yeah, see, that's the thing is that Jarrett was trying a variety of things while Lawler was out of action, and he called Barnett and said, can I get Tommy Rich back? And he had come in and he tried to run, and he, and Tommy was a tremendous fucking heel. It was a revelation. If anybody see, the problem is the houses were at, you know, record low levels because Lawler was out, and it wasn't, that period is not well remembered, but he was a revelation as a heel for the first time in his life for about three months there, late 1980, early 81. And then they switched him baby face. And then he was on his way back to Georgia. They did the angle with his mom on TV. Remember? Yes. Like Tojo attacked her. <laughs> <laughs> he's, and, and they switched Jimmy Valiant heel. And he started wearing that dark eye makeup and Miss Piggy, Piggy Rich. <laughs> and Tojo slaps and, and Tommy's mother probably weighed about as much as he did. She just was shorter. Uh, but Tojo slapped her and I think she swung back at him. There's some bizarre shit going on at that point, but it was just, it was trying anything that might catch on because Lawler had been out for so long and had so many setbacks with the leg. You know, it's interesting too. It's a weekly territory, obviously, with this strong TV. But Jimmy Hart's a manager that. For the most part, you never had to like build up to the big moment where he gets hit. Like every match, he was getting punched and taking a bump, and it never took away from his heat. Well, th that's the thing. It wouldn't have worked in Louisiana. It wouldn't have worked it with with Watts's approach to things because they were used to the big build up. So if you had done it just every week, it probably would have killed a guy. But in Memphis, because it being weekly, as you said, and because, you know, a small crew and everything had to be wild, the managers got the shit kicked out of them, too, on a regular basis, which flies in the face of and contradicts normal wrestling philosophy. But that's why you got so good as a manager, because they let you get heat, too. And you got a lot of practice. Not only did you get the shit kicked out of you, but you... You were in every finish, or you were passing gimmicks, or they put you on TV and let you talk and get your heat back. And they were figuring finishes where you'd be actively involved. So there was always something going on. And the baby faces got a lot of you, but you got a lot of the baby faces too. And I mean, and, and you know, if, if you did it right, the baby faces could sell for the manager long enough through nefarious means with gimmicks and cheating and whatever the fuck that you know then when he made the comeback you just you didn't want to take the and jimmy about every once a year or so he would get actually just carried the fuck out right otherwise he'd be bumped around and punched and maybe pinned or spanked or whatever but he would be able to scamper away yelling at people as he did it and that, that's, that was kind of the, you, you had to be on your toes, and you, but you had chances to keep your heat if you were good at getting it to begin with. 
Well, there it is, some classic audio to uh, break things up, and we'll probably do this again pretty soon.